So what is motor preference, you ask? Well, simply a motor preference is an athlete's preferred motor strategy when they execute a task. It's their most natural, most efficient way of doing a thing. And it's based upon their own unique individual capacities and abilities. An easy way to think about it, you wouldn't expect Usain Bolt to sprint just like Christian Coleman, right? Of course not. They're entirely different people. This is obvious. One's six foot five, the other's five foot eight. One's 215 pounds, the other's 165. What is not as obvious though, is the differences between say, Christian Coleman and Sue Bing Tang or two NFL wide receivers who are both six foot and 215 pounds. But they're still different with a totally different set of capacities and abilities that all comes together to dictate how they move. The problem for us is trying to understand these differences. As an industry, we've done generally a pretty good job of understanding what is required to execute certain tasks. We kind of know that a fast football player needs the ability to apply high amounts of force in a fast amount of time. But what we don't know is how each individual does this and how the differences between individuals may affect how we coach them and how we treat them. This is the key to being successful in sport, no matter if you're a coach, sports scientist, or a therapist. Your job in sport is to understand the individual relationship between load and adaptation to that load. And this is where motor preferences come in. In the next 10 or 12 minutes, I'm going to show you how to determine the motor preference of your athletes and how you can use this information to improve their health and performance. Guaranteed. I really feel like this is, I know it says an evolution, but I think this is going to be revolutionary. I think this is really going to lay the landscape for the next decade or two in sport performance. I first started thinking about this in the 90s when myself and my colleague and good friend, Dr. Matt Jordan, following on from some of the work of uh, Charles Poliquin, began to categorize and classify athletes to what their movement biases were, whether they preferred to pull things or to push things, and whether they preferred to be on one leg or two. Once we could determine this information, it gave us a great, great head start on putting together their programs. And over the years, it also started to give us further insight into injury patterns. For example, Pull dominant athletes tended to have more calf and Achilles injuries, whereas push dominant athletes tended to have more hip flexor and adductor issues. But with technology, what it was at the time, remember this is in the 90s, as well as our limited resources and, re and limited, um, frankly, expertise and experience, we were never that comfortable with how we came about classifying each athlete. It was a little overly binary as well as a little overly subjective. We had no way of objectively measuring whether an athlete was a puller or a pusher. So while this remained a big part of how we coached over the next 15, 20 years or so, there was always a piece of the puzzle missing. Recently, however, that piece has been found. In 2015, Cyril Gendre and Thibaut Luciana released a paper called Aerial and Terrestrial Patterns, a novel approach to analyzing human running. The coach and the scientist together looked to verify whether their subjective rating scale, where they classified running into two categories, aerial and terrestrial, could be objectively validated. Using a length of optogen, they compared aerial and terrestrial runners and showed that area runners did indeed have longer flight times. Also greater center of mass displacement, a greater leg and vertical stiffness than their terrestrial counterparts. 
This is an awesome little paper. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend you check it out. But it's also the beginning of a long list of work from these authors and their colleagues at Boladol. I mean, it's 22 or 23 papers since uh, being released, but for, since this first one. And they've continued to work on finding ways to objectively measure athletes' motor, their most natural motor preferences. A few years later, Ben Van Uveren at the University of Amsterdam added another layer. By not only looking at ground contact and flight time, like Gindry and Luciana had, but also step frequency and step length, which in essence led to this dual axis framework where runners were could, where could be categorized into five different running styles. While I really like this paper, I'm not a fan of their visualization here, nor how they term the categories, but that's okay. Because at the same time, my friend, Dr. James Wild was also working on his own dual axis framework. In 2022, James released an awesome paper called Characterizing Initial Sprint Acceleration Strategies Using a Whole Body Kinematic Approach. And he identified four whole body kinematic strategies using some of the same variables as Van Uveren, but using professional rugby players and also normalizing for leg length. On the vertical axis here, you see step length, step rate ratio plotted as a Z-score. And on the horizontal axis, you see the ratio between contact time and flight time, also as a Z-score. So the average of all the players would be in the very middle of the plot. And the bigger the outlier, the further out towards the edges of the plot they would be. Now, there's a ton of really powerful information in this graphic alone. But the two that jump out to me are, number one, the distinction between the players is really big. They're literally all over the plot. It's a very heterogeneous group, right? I mean, they're literally everywhere. But also, the faster players are also all over the plot. See, the bigger the circle, the faster the player. And you can see big circles everywhere. Together, these two findings show that players have very different running strategies and that there are many ways to run fast, at least within this group of 28 or so rugby players. Many of us who've been doing this for a long time kind of already knew this, right? But this is still groundbreaking information for so many in the industry. Again, it's a really awesome paper from James. But what could come next? Myself, I'd be really interested to find out whether an athlete's preferred strategy correlated with various types of injuries. And that's exactly what James has been working on since. In an article on the Sportsmith site in 2023, James shared some of his data, as we see on this graphic here. Now, without getting too caught up in the details here, just the fact that we can now look to relate running stretch an athlete's motor preference with potential injury and correlate those two together is potentially groundbreaking for the entire industry. If we know, for example, that we have a player in quadrant one, and we know that the most frequent frequent injury types of quadrant run players are related to the calf, the Achilles, and the feet, then how would you use this information to inform your training with that athlete, their therapy, their homework, It's so powerful. This is really, really important information. But it gets even better. Last year, myself and Matt, again, Matt Jordan, my buddy, uh, up in Calgary, uh, using Motion IQ, analyzed some biomechanics data for an NFL team we do some consulting work with. Now, using Dr. Wild's dual axis quadrant framework, we plotted each strategy on their own plot. But this time, we looked at both legs comparing the strategies for the left against the right. On this graphic here, you see the plots of 16 players where the X's are the left leg. I think it could be the right leg. And the circles are the right. I think it could be the left. It doesn't matter. Of course, none of us are completely symmetrical, and that's not the goal, right? 
but we would hope that a decent degree of symmetry exists between what the left leg and what the right leg is doing while we're running. And by the way, these runs were all out 20 yard sprints. You'll see that most of the players on these graphics are indeed pretty symmetrical with a couple of exceptions. Most, most notably, number 15, where there's a massive difference between left and right legs. Now, taken by itself, this is really important information. But we should never take data points just by themselves, should we? There's always context. However, when, there, when it's this degree of asymmetry, almost four standard deviations apart, it's for sure really concerning. But the context is still more important. The power doesn't come until we know what the player's normal degree of asymmetry was. If we know, for example, that typically their X and their circle are right on top of each other, and now they're so far apart, well, that's really important informa in information, right? If we know that they're just a little bit of apart, and now they're far apart, that's really important information. If they're generally two standard deviations apart, and they're generally pretty healthy, but now they're four standard deviations apart, and now they're super hurt. Well, that's, inf that's really important information. And as a matter of fact, athlete number 15 was six months post major knee surgery. So now we can use this information to guide our return to play program. This is super powerful. Rather than using a proxy measure, like a force platform, we can use data that comes directly from the task the player is actually returning to play i.e. sprinting. That's what a football player does when they're on the field of play. They sprint. So if we can get accurate measurements of how they sprint and then track that over the course of time, we have this typical understanding of how a player moves. As well, if, we've kept, if we're tracking this enough, we'll have also have the typical amount of variation, the bandwidth around what is their typical mode of preference, a typical movement strategy. And so it is with all of this that we propose will change the health and performance landscape over the next decade. The more we know about the many unique and individual running strategies of athletes, from elite sprinters, as we see here, to developmental football players and everything in between, the better informed we are on how to design their programs, what exercises to prescribe, and what types of sports medicine service they will receive. In this graphic, I've used Dr. Wilde's dual access framework again, and further divided it into degrees of strategy, with a middle box showing no real true mode of preference at all. The second box, that's the box just, just outside of the middle box, that's a mild preference. The third box, that's a slightly bigger one. That's a strong preference. And then outside of that, well, that's a problem. That's a problematic preference. The great work now comes from aligning these preferences with all of the individual capacities and abilities we see with various types of athletes. What type of instruction works best with each type? Which types of movements and exercises, et cetera? What type of instruction should we use? And what should we avoid? There's lots of work to do here. It's early days, but already we've had some really exciting results, as you saw a little bit earlier from that uh, uh, NFL example, both from our own data as well as others from all over the world. We're running this project with a few NFL teams, as I said, as well as the U.S. men's national soccer team. And already it's been used to great effect to inform many programs. Thank you for listening. I really hope you'll consider joining us as we finally learn how to connect what an athlete does with how they do it.